Well, we're here with Peter Keck to see what we can learn from his remarkable 2022 sailing season. <laughs> Peter won the ILYA Sea Scout Championship, the Sea Scout Nationals, and just recently won the U.S. Sailing Champion of Champions Regatta, which was sailed in MC Scouts. Welcome, Peter, and thanks for your willingness to share your insights. Of course. Thanks, Al. And yeah, uh, is... shout out to Salesing Nation out there. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, first, could you give us a brief, brief, a brief background about your sailing career and any, any major influences that over the years, and I know you've been doing this for a long time, but yeah. over the years have helped you become really good. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, was born and raised here in southeastern Wisconsin and uh, grew up on Lake LaBelle and, you know, participated in the Expo class there and had a decent Expo career. Um, I went to Wisconsin and did some college sailing for Wisconsin. That um, was really good practice. But then at the end of college and after college, I started crewing for uh, Andy Burdick on the Sea Scout. And I think sailing with Andy and watching how he does stuff uh, really took me from a good sailor to a better sailor. Mm -hmm. I really, I really uh, attribute that to Andy Burdick. And what uh, boats have you been campaigning? I know ILYA sailors know this, but the rest of our audience probably doesn't. Yeah, so the um, I did some laser sailing back in the day, just uh, during college and after college. But um, the majority of my uh, driving has been in the Sea Scout class. Um, but I've done a lot of crewing um, in the East Scout fleet and the A Scout fleet. And relatively recently, I started driving a an e scow uh, teaming up with Mark Hetzler from uh, Delavan, and um, he's been great to share his tillers with me at times. Well, let's get into the uh, the champion of champions we've got her first. Um, you, you know, and I saw a Facebook post with you and Bill Dreheim on this subject, but uh, unusual for us scow sailors. But at, at, at this regard, you had to declare single or double handed before the before the uh, regatta even started. Uh, tell us how you made that decision and how it played out. Yeah, so I I had a little trouble finding a crew that I would be comfortable sailing with, but then I did find a, um, a local crew out there and um, basically waited until the last possible minute to declare, um, analyzing the, the forecast carefully. Uh, my thinking was that if it would average 12 or below that I would single hand and if it would average 12 or above that I would would double hand. But you're right, it's an interesting format for those of us that are, uh, you know, in the in the inland where we get to choose per race. And talk about how that played out. I mean, we all know you you uh, had a, a really good first two days. And then the last day got apparently got significantly windier and um, you had to hang on a little bit. Yeah, that's how it played out. Uh, so it, the format of the regatta was a 20 race, 20 boat series where it's college style, where you switch boats every race and um, in an effort to, you know, make it as, as fair as possible, you, they tried to sail all 20 races. So everyone competed in each of the boats. Um, and I would say in general, the breeze increased through the entire series. The first day was relatively light. Um, I would say six to 10. And the second day was more medium, uh, maybe like eight to 12. And the third day was supposed to be 12 and it ended up being a little more than that. I mean, it was probably, I don't know, 13 to 16 with gusts higher. I'm 175. So you can tell that all of your uh, viewers who are, are avid MC sailors could tell that I was struggling a little. And uh, yeah. And so your, your, uh, your break points that you had thought about beforehand were probably pretty accurate. Yeah. I didn't expect it to be 
as windy on Sunday as it was. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that we would have more races in by then and less to do on Sunday. Um, the original intent was to do eight, eight and four. And uh, we got cut short on Saturday and only got five races in on Saturday. So they were trying to do as many as they could fit in by the 2.30 deadline on Sunday. So what would you say to a, a, particularly an MC sailor who's facing the decision about, you know, somebody who's in, you know, your weight range, uh, would you say that there's a huge disadvantage to uh, taking a crew on in marginal crew conditions or what did you notice about that? Well, um, I guess I can't say with certainty because I didn't experience that condition. You know, I be sailing by myself. I didn't sail with a crew in conditions where you wouldn't have wanted a crew, but judging from the fleet and what I saw, it was, I had a pretty big advantage um, it, when it was, when it was those conditions where you wouldn't normally take a crew and I was by myself, I would say I was probably the lightest out of all 20 teams. And you could see it in boat speed. Is that what is? For sure. On the first day I would upwind, especially I was just sailing away from some of the teams that had two on. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Um, you know, we all know, we all know you in the inland and how you, you sail, you do all the fundamentals really well. You keep your boat moving in almost all conditions, your good boat handling starts, etc. I think our viewers would like to hear more about your approach to strategy and tactics. And maybe first, did you see this as a boat speed regatta or uh, or strategy and tactics or both and was, was one more dominant than the other? Yeah, I think it may have been a little bit more boat speed dominant just because of the short track racing and the, uh, um, you know, there just wasn't enough time and room and, um, to, to really get to the bigger shifts, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I, I, you know, I spend a fair amount of time looking at the forecast just to make sure that um, I know if we're sailing in a persistent shift versus an oscillating shift. Um, but beyond that, I just focus on being in the velocity and, and keeping my head out of the boat and looking up the, looking up the lake to, as we say, connect the dots and stay in the velocity. We hear from uh, Stefan, Seth Robel and Maggie Shea that they have a really extensive pre-race routine. You know, they check boat speed, they understand, they try to understand just what you mentioned about uh, persistent or oscillating. Uh, they check the line bias, they get line sights, uh, time and distance and all of that stuff. And, and, and do you have a similar approach? Uh, um. I mean, yeah, I definitely think about all those things. I don't have a, a rigorous routine, I don't think. Um, maybe more so in our, my sea scow when I sail with, with my super crew, Ben Porter. But um, being at this event and being in a different boat every race and, you know, having a relatively small starting line and a relatively small race course, it, it was more... Um, just about doing a systems check each time you get in a new boat and making sure everything works, making sure the hiking straps are set where you want them and, and that the boards go up and down as you expect and uh, being comfortable with all that stuff. Let's go back a little bit to the, uh, you know, the longer uh, regattas, longer race regattas like the Ski Scow Nationals and the Inlands. Uh, because I really want to dwell into this strategy. You said a lot of the things that we all hear about, connecting the dots, et cetera, persistent oscillating. Um, when you approach these longer races, do you spend a lot of time before the race trying to figure out which of those it might be? I would say, I mean, the, the persistent oscillating stuff is more about looking at the forecast before you leave the dock in my mind, once you get out to the race course, it's nice to, you know, sail around both corners of the race course, just to see if there's any 
geographical bias to the to the racing circle but otherwise i just spend a lot of time watching other boats sail upwind and doing wind checks myself uh either looking at flags on race committee or laughing head to wind in a lot of different places on the line do you use a compass in the bigger regattas uh bigger lakes yes i do use a compass for the sea scale racing that we do on the bigger tracks and uh I mean, I think that's pretty helpful, especially for the, uh, you know, distance to the line. But how about yeah. the headings for uh, sailing upwind? Yeah, Ben and I watch the numbers on the compass carefully and are always aware of what our high number is and what our low number is and how how up or down we are from what we tacked onto. Is there a something that tells you when to prioritize being on the lifted tack versus, you know, being in pressure? Yeah. I mean, all the small lakes that we sail on around the inland, it's it's a hard decision to make. And I think it's more about keeping your boat, your head out of the boat and looking up the lake and understanding if, if you're in the best pressure uh, before you make a decision like that. Because oftentimes on these small lakes, we need to sail a knock to get to the meat of the puff to, to tack and stay in it. I imagine this was a pretty interesting experience for you. I don't, you haven't sailed in this regard, this champion of champions regatta before, have you? I have not. Yeah. So what were your takeaways from this experience sailing with all these top sailors from other classes? I mean, I think it's a really cool idea. I've been invited a handful of times in the past years, and I've always thought that it's a really cool idea to take a bunch of one design sailors and have them sail against each other in the same boat. So I was kind of excited to go do it in a scow, especially. What'd you learn from some of the uh, other competitors? Anything? Well, they're all really good sailors. I, you know, went in there not knowing how I was going to do. Um, I really didn't know any of the competitors. I looked at the roster and saw what classes they uh, qualified in. I, I learned over the weekend that a lot of the sailors had ties to the scow to the scow fleets even if they didn't qualify in our scow which i thought was interesting you guys probably know that matt fisher oh yeah he's a avid scow sailor right. even though he qualified in inner lakes or something like that and uh you know there was a bunch of other good good sailors there um you know many had ties to the scow communities but the thistle guys and the lightning guys are really good too. Uh, someone made a com a local sailor that wasn't competing in the regatta made a comment to me in the parking lot after the event was over that he was glad that the scow guys went one two and that the lightning and thistle guys didn't beat us in our own boat. And they they gave you a run for it. It was you know we thought it was all sewed up after the second day. And it's amazing. And it was fun talking to Dave Stark. We have a video that just went live today. I, I interviewed him. and Yeah, it was really nice meeting Dave and his wife. They're very good sailors. Yeah. It was interesting to see how quickly they figured out the boat, too. Well, he and he talked about that. He, he said angle of heel. We all know about that. And uh, not pinching were his two big watchwords. Mm -hmm. um, do you sail the MC scow a little bit different? Then you sail the sea scow. I think from an angle of heel standpoint, it's identical. I mean, uh, it's a little bit different with the the mass differences. First of all, the rotating mass we have on the sea scow, but also the uh, trimming the main from the from the middle of the boom versus the end of the boom really is a lot different from how you can generate leech tension on the sea scow um, that way. But as far as, you know, depowering the boat and angle of heel and balancing, I, th I think all of my sea scow experience helped me a lot. So go into that uh, end of the boom uh, a little more. Yeah, I understand you, 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 can, you can get the end of the boom to rise in the MC scow, you know, if you just ease a little bit with Vang on. Not, you know, probably, well, probably also with the sea scow, but talk a little more about that. Well, I mean, I... I just think you can control the leech tension a lot easier with the sheet tension on the C scow and on the MC, you really have to balance between vang sheeting and 
cheating, cheating and dropping tracks to yeah. get the same level of tension on the leech in the MC. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's a little more, uh, it's a little more fussy that way in terms of what combination. I will say I was surprised how quickly the MC powered up that, uh, you know, you can, if you're a 170 pound sailor on an MC, you start to feel overpowered relatively early. I mean, in the 10 miles an hour of breeze range, you're starting to depower the boat, um, which I was a little surprised at because in the sea boat, when we sail with, with two, you wouldn't be depowering at all in that stuff. So maybe that says you want to add a crew a little earlier if in an MC, if you're, you know, my size. You probably don't pinch much or at all. Um, is that different in the MC and the C? It's, it seems like you can get away with pinching a little easier in the MC. I think I was sailing a little bit higher than um, some MC sailors would. I, I think you can have a high mode in the MC upwind, especially if you have, you know, full power in the boat. I end up sailing a little higher than others in the sea scow as well at times. And uh, I think it's, it can be situational. I don't, like to be named a pincher or a footer i i just like to do what you need to do in in the situation that you're given you know so you'll pinch when you maybe need to get to a puff or a foot when you when you need to get to a puff and yeah i mean especially when you're working a lane um where you have a boat above you and a boat below you and you need to maintain that lane for a little while you sometimes have to go into foot mode or if you feel like you're in a knocked phase and you need to hurry to the next shift, you can go into a footing phase and vice versa into a pinching phase. I imagine there was quite a bit of traffic at the, uh, uh, at the champion of champions regatta. How did you, uh, how did you find that and how did you deal with it? Just got out in front and stayed out. Well, in the early lighter races, that was maybe true, but, um, you know, in the medium and heavy breeze, a lot of boats got to the weather mark at the same time. And you really did have to uh, pick your spots and, and avoid others. There was a lot of times when people were finishing, all of our races were W2s with a downwind finish. So there was a lot of times when boats were very close and it was not uncommon to see four boats cross the finish line in one boat length. So maintaining an upwind well, both up and down, maintaining a clear lane, even though the lane, the legs were short, you probably still had to worry about clear air, right? For sure. Another thing I noticed was that um, when it did get breezier, the speed difference between myself single-handed and some of the double-handed teams was even more exaggerated downwind. So even though I had a disadvantage upwind, I had a slight advantage downwind. Um, which maybe allowed me to hang on a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Dave, anyway, told us that uh, playing the Vang downwind was something he really learned. Uh, and he said he was all constantly adjusting it. Yeah, I was doing that too. Even more so than the sea scow. We usually don't put Vang on downwind in the sea scow until we're, it's pretty windy. Um, but in the MC, you had to put a little Vang on just to make sure that that top didn't twist away well anything else that you want to you want to say about uh your season i mean it was a just amazing season you were consistent in all the big regattas and many of the little ones that you also won um was this just a lucky year or <laughs> what would you say i don't know i think um you know we upgraded our sea scow um, in 2021, we got a 2020 that had been used for a year and um, it's nice having the new equipment. I think the new products uh, from Melgus are really nice. And, uh, you know, sailing with Ben Porter all these years, we've re really kind of got it tuned in a little bit on the Sea Scow. So we're just feeling fast. Well, thanks for showing the uh, sailing world what the what the inland uh, sailors are all about. It's we're really proud of you, and uh, again, thanks for uh, for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Yeah, thank you.